You're welcome. Wow, that's a lot of baggage. Are you checking in all of that baggage with us today? Yeah. You would like it to fly with you to each and every single destination? Yeah, that's uh, bringing it with me. I'm going to need you to weigh all of that baggage on the scale here, please, for us. There we go. Your baggage is heavy. Oh. Wow, it appears even your baggage has its own baggage. So in our tier system for baggage pricing, yours is marked as excessive, which means that your checked-in baggage comes to a total of $150 in the addition to the $25 travel fee, and the carry-on that you're taking will be an additional $75, not to mention the overages, bringing your grand total to $525.78 with us. How will you be paying? Uh, debit, I guess. Okay. Sure. Is there anything else we can do today to make your experience more accommodating or comfortable for you and or all of your baggage? No, no, <clears throat> no. You just please take my baggage. Good morning, Sandals Church. Yes, it's good to be back. Hopefully you brought your baggage with you today, which I'm sure that you did. Let's talk about traveling. How many of you guys, I mean, because every single one of us is an overpacker or an underpacker. How many overpackers do we have? Okay, yeah, yeah, right. I'm married to all of you. My wife is an overpacker. Every time we go on vacation, my wife lies. She says, I just need a little bit of your suitcase. Just a little. It's always amazing that her packing overflows into my packing. Now, to lift my wife's bag, you need a degree in CrossFit, okay? I mean, literally, every time we put on the scale, I'm like, you know that's over 50 pounds. She says, I feel like it's close. I said, it isn't really about your feelings. It's about the scale. <laughs> it's about the scale, right? So there are overpackers. My wife is packed for every emergency. She's a six on the Enneagram. What might happen could happen, so she needs to be prepared for it. Like, she's prepared for World War III when we go on vacation. She packs everything. If the airplane goes down, loses an engine at any point, we can use her hair dryer to fly, right, the right wing because it's that powerful. I'm like, really? What are we going to do? You know, blow away a small child or comb your hair? What is that thing? It's just gigantic. But I... I'm on the opposite. I never pack enough. I always underestimate what we need. I always think, well, I can get it if I need it when we get there. A couple years ago, we went to Vietnam, okay? Vietnam has mosquitoes. They're so big, they wear T-shirts. That's how big they are in Vietnam. And I just thought, you know, I'll go to the store. If I need bug spray, I'll get bug spray in Vietnam. They don't have bug spray in Vietnam, okay? Do you know what a white man in Vietnam smells like to a Vietnamese mosquito? You ever been to like any sporting event in Southern California? Afterwards, they're selling those hot dogs. You know what I'm talking about? On the grill, it's pork wrapped in pork, fried in pork fat. And it makes a ve vegetarian go, maybe, right? You know those, those, <laughs> those hot dogs, you know what I'm saying, right? That's what a white guy from America smells like to a Vietnamese mosquito. They wanted me, they pursued me, it was horrible. And my wife's like, I told you, you should have packed them. I'm like, yeah. Meanwhile, I'm getting eaten alive, right? So I'm an underpacker. So let me just say this. I don't know where you are in life, but the reality is in this series, I'm gonna challenge you every week, what'd you pack? What'd you pack? What's in your bag? Because here's the reality. Whether we're an overpacker and maybe we need to lighten our load, or maybe we're an underpacker and we haven't packed the right things, we all need to be willing to look at our luggage because wherever you go, it goes with you. And here's the thing, man, it's costing a lot of you. It's costing you, okay? At Southwest, bags fly free, but in life, they don't. They cost you money. They cost you time. They cost you literally, for some of you, your sanity, and you need to deal with that baggage before it deals with you. So let's just begin with a word of prayer, and let's ask God to help us deal with our baggage, amen? Because you got it. I got it. We got it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that the spirit of truth would be with us. God, every single one of us has baggage. God, some of us are carrying things that we don't need. And some of us, Lord, have not put the right things in our bags. God, help us to deal with this today. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Whenever you pack your bags at the airport and you're going to multiple airports, here's the question they ask you as you check your bags. What's your final destination? Where are you going? Because sometimes you're flying to Chicago, but you're not ending up in Chicago. You're going somewhere else. Where is your final destination? Where is it that ultimately you wanna go? Because the, what they wanna make sure is that your bags, 
get where your final destination is. Now, it doesn't always happen. One time, my final destination was Africa. My baggage's final destination was Europe. So, right, Jesus' great miracle is that he fed the 5,000. My great miracle is I wear the same pair of underwear for five days in Africa. Yeah. Even the mosquitoes there are like, nope, that's a dirty dude. Nope, not going, not going near that guy, right? So what's your final destination? Where are you going? Where are you going in life? Some of you never ever think about where you're going to end up. And here's why you need to think about this, because you're gonna spend a lot more time in eternity than you are here and now. Where are you going? This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, he's assuming you're a Christian. Most of you are Christians, some of you are not. Here's the assumption that you're a Christian. As Christians, set your sights on the realities of heaven. I want you to circle that word realities. Because that's one of the things that we have to determine in life. What's real? What's not real? Literally, man, people are lost in worlds that are not real. On vacation, one of the things that my son and I went and did is we, we did VR, virtual reality. I look like the biggest idiot ever in virtual reality. I was dizzy in three seconds. Three seconds, dizzy, confused. They put this thing on your face and all of a sudden you're in a different world. Different world. You're lost. A lot of you are in non-reality. You're in virtual reality. And you need to come back and know this. Jesus says heaven is very real. It's very, very real. More real than this world because that world lasts forever. Where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Underline these words. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Do you know why you're stressed out? It's not because you're thinking about heaven. It's because you're thinking about Monday. It's because you're thinking about Tuesday. Listen to me, most of you are overwhelmed with life because you are underwhelmed with God. No matter what point in life you're in right now, it's just a season. High school, thank God, just a season. College, thank God, just a season. Right? Parenting children under five, amen, just a season. Just a season. Just a season. We have some missionaries from our church staying at our house. They got four kids, many of them under five. You don't need an alarm clock when you have a one-year-old. <laughs> Whoops, time to get up. The suffering is going to begin. It's just a season. Just a season. Many of you are overwhelmed with life because you were underwhelmed with God. Think about the things of heaven. Most of us don't think about heaven. We don't. And here's the reason we don't think about it is because we assume everybody's going. You see, in the ancient world, they thought no one was going to heaven. In the modern world, we think everyone's going to heaven. When have you ever been to a funeral where they're like, yep, that guy's in hell. Who thinks so? Raise your hands. <laughs> like, what do we do at funerals? We lie. He was so generous, you're like, is this my dad's funeral? <laughs> Confused, right? He was so loving, where am I? I must be in the wrong room. We lie at funerals, nobody's honest, right? We overinflate the good and we minimize the bad. That's what we do in our culture. In the ancient world, they were real about death. One of the things I did while I was gone is we went to Egypt and we went to the old pyramids, the pyramids at Giza, one of the most famous things you'll ever see. And what amazed me about the pyramids is when I began to learn why the pharaohs built the pyramids. Which way did the pyramids point? Does anyone know? Up. Because the pharaohs knew they were going to die and they believed that you had to work so hard to make it to heaven. And so their whole life, all their wealth, all their fortune was spent on building the biggest pyramid they could possibly build. The height of the pyramid is based upon two things. Number one, the wealth of the pharaoh. And number two, the age of the Pharaoh. The longer they lived, the more they built, the higher it got. And when they were, 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 were buried, they were buried with everything, absolutely everything, their wealth, oftentimes their wives, right? You guys, that's safety. You know, hey, when I go, you go, sweetie, so you better make sure that my food isn't poisoned. So everybody went with them, right? Their wives, man, horses, weapons, uh, gold, you name it. They were buried with vast amounts of wealth because they believed that they needed all of that to get to the next life. But inside many of these pyramids, there's a painting in hydroglyphics, a beautiful, amazing artwork. And it's a scene of judgment day. And here's what a lot of people don't know about mummies. A mummy is the body of a dead person wrapped to be preserved forever. But one of the things that's missing from the mummy is the heart. 
The heart is taken out of the mummy and it's placed in a separate bag, a separate container. And here's why. Inside these pyramids, in hydroglyphics, you see the Pharaoh standing before the one true God, Ra. That's who they believed in. And they, remember, the Jewish people have 10 commandments. The Egyptians had 42 commandments. And then there's 42 little gods. And each of the little gods judges the heart of Pharaoh. And literally, it's placed in a scale. On the other side of the scale is the stone of justice. And their heart is measured against justice. You see, the Egyptians believed it was almost impossible to go to heaven. Nowadays, we think everybody goes to heaven. Here's what Jesus says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to God but by me. We need to think about that. We need to be ready. Where's your final destination? You see, some of you are gonna waste your life building your dream home, and you're gonna miss out on your eternal home. And let me say this to our seniors. A lot of times we focus on the mistakes that young people make, but let me tell you something. On the day of judgment, many of you are gonna be more accountable for what you did in your later years than you did in your early years because you wasted the end of your life. Since you've been raised to new life in Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven. This is why you need to go to church. Some of you go to church once a month. That means you think about the things of heaven once a month and you're overwhelmed with the things of life for the rest of the 30 days. And you wonder why you're stressed out. You wonder why you're overwhelmed because you're fixated and focused on the wrong things. I need to pack for where I'm going. Where am I going? Right? Where am I going? I need to pack for where I'm going. If you're going to Hawaii, pack a bathing suit. Why are you going to Hawaii? You don't need a coat. You do not need a coat in Hawaii. That is wasted packing. If you're going to Alaska, get a coat. Get a coat. Where are you going? Where are you headed? What is your ultimate destination? Many of us are packing for a place that we're not going. Hebrews 11, eight through 10, by an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. Some of you guys don't know who Abraham is. Abraham is the founder of three great religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Here's how he founded those great religions. He started following God. He started following God. He left where he was and he went to another destination. Listen to me, if you have not changed the destination to which you are walking, you are not following Jesus. If nothing changes in your life when you become a Christian, then you have not become a Christian. Where are you going? He left everything, he left his family, he left his security, he left everything, underline this, to go to an unknown place. Look, I think there's a reason the Bible is ultimately vague about heaven. It gives us some details, but not all the details. Because here's why. God wants us to follow him, not a place. It's about him, not a place. When you're traveling someplace, what do you do? You Google it. You find out what's it like. You talk to your friends who've been there. You find out people. You find out the inside secrets, and you focus on the destination. God is not about a destination. He's about a relationship. He wants you to follow him, not the place. So oftentimes, you know what Jesus doesn't talk about? He doesn't talk about heaven, he talks about hell. He talks about where you don't wanna go. Here's what he says. It would be better if you gouged out your own eye or cut off your own right hand than go to hell. That's what he says, you don't wanna go there. You don't wanna go there. That is not where you wanna be. And that's tragic because in our world today, we think everybody's going to heaven and Jesus said this, narrow is the road that leads to life and there are few that find it. Do you know why people don't find it? Because they don't think about where they're going. By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call. Have you said yes to God's call in your life? For most of us, what we're doing is we're asking God to say yes to our desires. We're not saying yes to his desires. God leads us out of our comfort zones, not into them. Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. You're not home yet if you're a Christian. You're not home. Amen. This week, Tammy and I went up to Forest Home Camps. We were walking around to see our daughters. They've worked up there all summer. And let me just say this. If you wanna know how you transition from young to old, here's one of the signs. When you become a plaque reader. 
When you start reading plaques, you have officially transitioned from young to old. See, when you're young, you're going so fast, you don't have time to read. When you're old, you need breaks. So you see a plaque, oh, somebody must have. So my family makes fun of me because I'm a plaque reader. Everywhere we go, I read plaques. Somebody put a, put a plaque there, we gotta read it. So we walk into this chapel up to Forest Home. We walk into this place, it's kind of cool, looking around, I've never seen it before. I can tell that the last time it was lovingly refreshed was the 70s because the pews are gold, right? So this is how you can date a church. If things are green, orange, or gold, that's 70s, right? It's the 70s, right? It's a different ABBA, right? That was a joke, yeah, sorry. So look it up, it's a band, okay. So we go in there, we're looking around, kind of smells, kind of musty, there's rat poop, stuff like that, you know, sitting around and I look at this plaque and this is what it says. This chapel is dedicated to my mother. Her name is Urza, that sounds painful. Urza, Think, I hope to God there's not a woman in here named Urza, I am so sorry if you've come to Sandals. We love you, uh, but your name is rough. Okay, anyways. <laughs> Her name is Urza, right? Um, and so he's just talking about his mom, and this is what he said about his mom. He said, my mom was not wealthy according to worldly standards, but this earth was not her home. He said, we built this in honor of my mom who taught me what real wealth was, and we wanna dedicate her favorite song that will be sung until time passes away. And they wrote the lyrics to her favorite song. And what's funny is, I grew up a Baptist kid, I sang this song, I don't know how often, but we sang it probably hundreds, if not thousands of times. I never knew what the song meant. I always thought it was weird. The song was, we shall gather at the river, which I just thought was weird. Why are we gonna gather at the river? I grew up in Sacramento, I thought it was the Sacramento River. I thought when we died, we're all gonna go to the Sacramento River and we're gonna gather with the American River and the Sacramento River come together. It didn't make any sense, but apparently Jesus likes rivers. And I read the lyrics, it says, we shall all gather at that river, that glorious river, that is clear as glass made from God, right? We will gather together at the river that flows from the throne of God. It's talking about Revelation chapter 22, a new earth, a new city with a river with no pollution that's as clear as glass that flows from God. He said, that's her home. That's where my mother is. And that's where I wanna go. And he said this, he dedicated, think about it, dedicated this chapel to his mom. 1962, they dedicated that. And I just was in tears, because it reminded me, man. Life is flying by. Anybody notice? Life is flying by. Like when you're little, five minutes is forever. Does anybody remember as a kid, when you drove anywhere, you're like, oh my gosh, this takes forever. And then you're an adult, you're like, oh, that was 20 minutes. It was bizarre. 20 minutes. All of a sudden you get older and time starts flying. Does anybody realize, raise your hand if you just realize time's flying. You know what I did this summer? This summer I did a wedding for one of the pastors in our church, their daughter. She's been in our church since she was eight years old. Eight years old. Man, I've known her elementary school, junior high school, high school, college, now she's getting married. And I was like, be emotionally tough. <laughs> and I was good, I was good. Until one of her bridesmaids who happens to be my daughter came down the aisle. Woo! I could feel the moisture gathering. <laughs> Why? Because life is flying like that. My daughter Madison was the first baby I ever held. Never held an infant before. They're scary. Hold one first, guys. <laughs> Just say, hey, can I borrow your child for a second? <laughs> they're, te they're terrifying. She came out orange. We had to send her back. <laughs> and they cook her. It's a real thing, look it up. It's the first diaper I ever changed. God, I didn't know about that. Woo. They're cute, but they stink. I saw her learn to walk, taught her how to read, took her to school. And all of a sudden, here she is, a woman walking down an aisle. Listen to me, life is flying by. You don't have much time. Time flies here, it's forever there. Be ready, be ready. Some of you are not ready. By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. When he left, he had no idea where he was going. By an act of faith, he lived in a country, promised him. He lived, underline this, as a stranger. Some of you are way too comfortable with this life. 
way too comfortable. You like it too much here. I wanna challenge you guys. I wanna wanna challenge you to read this book. You wanna be terrified? Read a book by C.S. Lewis called The Great Divorce. It is not about marriage, right? What is divorce? Divorce is tearing apart something that should not be torn apart. The Bible says the two become one flesh and let no one tear it apart. Divorce is the ripping of something that was made for each other apart. The great divorce is not about your mom and dad. It's not about your marriage. It's about you and God being ripped apart. And here's the story. Now, we don't agree as a church with all of C.S. Lewis's theology, but he is brilliant. And in his book, he talks about people who are way too comfortable at earth. When they get to heaven, the grass doesn't feel right and the fruit is too heavy. And even though there are angels beckoning and begging people, cross the river, come on, you'll get used to it, you'll like it. We promise people knowingly and willingly walk away from heaven and walk straight into the crack that ultimately leads to hell because they're not comfortable with heaven. The grass hurts their feet and the apple weighs too much because they loved the things of this world. Look, enjoy some of the things of this world, but don't love it, love God. Because this world is passing away. This world is fading. He lived in a country promised him and he lived as a stranger camping in tents. How did Abraham do this? He did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with real eternal foundations. Heaven is not imagination, it's reality. The city designed and built by God. I wanna write a book someday called 10 Things Not to Do in California. I don't know where this will be, but it's gonna be number one or number two, and it's gonna be do not visit the San Andreas Fault. Don't do it. (laughs) Don't go there. Tammy and I went there a couple months ago. Don't do it. It will terrify you. It will absolutely terrify you when you go to the San Andreas Fault that's literally like 50 miles from where we stand. When you go there, there's a gigantic crack in the earth. And as you see the mountains, you see mountains that point up, point sideways, point down, and point flat. And do you know why that is? Because when the earth shakes, the mountains point where they're told. It's terrifying. There is no city that can withstand that kind of shaking that's built by human beings. But listen to me. I know some of you are engineers from Caltech. I want you to know, it is not an earthquake on earth that you need to fear. The Bible says that there is a great earthquake that is so mighty, it will not only shake the earth, but it will shake the heavens, and the stars will fall, and the sun will turn to darkness at the great coming of the Lord. And we need to remember that. There is not a human city that can withstand that shaking. The Bible says when he returns, men will pray that rocks fall on their heads. That's an interesting prayer, but that's what happens. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with the real eternal foundations. It's built by God. It's designed by God. It's beautiful and it's glorious and it's pollution free. The river flows like glass. It is crystal clear. And Jesus says, you don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. And think of all the hurt. Think of what's happening in America right now. Just so you know, the greatest nation on earth. It is by far, and it's still a mess. One of the things that the Bible says is that there's a tree that, that produces fruit every month. And it's leaves when they fall off. Do you know what it's for? Listen to me. For the healing of the nations. God's gonna heal racism. He's gonna heal it. He's gonna make it go away. It's going to be a beautiful, wonderful place. And all the kings and all the nations will worship the one true God. You don't wanna miss it, it's gonna be incredible. But here's the thing, some of you are not ready. Some of you are not ready, and especially Christians. Christians are some of the most uneducated, illiterate people about the day of judgment that I ever meet. Nobody knows about the day of judgment. Everybody says they wanna see it, but nobody's ready for it. And you know why that is? Because you don't read your Bibles. You don't read your Bibles. You know what Jesus is gonna judge? Write this down. Jesus will judge whatever I pack. One of the dumb things we say as Christians is this, you can't take it with you. Well, what if you do? 
What if on the day of judgment, you look like Santa Claus with a big fat sack full of crap? Here you are lugging everything you had through life. Here you are dragging it right with you. Let me tell you what's gonna happen. Jesus is gonna judge whatever you bring because no evil enters into heaven. None. It cannot go there. It must stop. It must be dealt with. Now, let me tell you, some of you grew up Catholic and you were taught about purgatory, okay? We don't believe in purgatory, but at least the Catholics tried to deal with this concept of judgment for Christians. As evangelicals, we just ignore it. We just pretend it's not there, but it is there. Jesus will judge whatever I pack. What have you packed? What are you carrying around? This last week, I kid you not, this is a real story. This really happened. I asked one of my community group members to do the Iron Man with me. And he said he would, so we're gonna start swimming together. So I invited him to my health club. And when you get ready to swim, you gotta pack your stuff, right? You gotta pack your goggles and because I'm sensitive earplugs, right? I gotta pack my chlorine-free shampoo because, you know, I'm just that kind of fabulous, <laughs> sensitive. I gotta pack a lot of stuff. I gotta make sure that I got my Gatorade, my energy bar because my feet cramp when I swim for too long. I gotta pack, you know, my Speedo so I'm electrically fast. <laughs> we get there bring them into my club, show them how to work the locker room. I, we're in a men's locker, guys, okay? This, you need, we're in a man's locker, okay? There's things, ladies, that happen in men's lockers that you just, just don't ever wanna see. It's just, it's foul. It's just, it's literally like walking through the valley of the shadow of death, right? But you fear the evil, you do, you see it and you fear it. So we walk through, you keep your head down, you go over to the locker, we're doing this stuff, we're talking. You know, we're a little nervous because it's our first time swimming together. I'm like, it's gonna be okay. I go to put on my Speedo, whoop, I put it on, and it feels funny. It doesn't feel right. Now for some of you, this is Friday night, but for me, okay, <laughs> this is unusual. This is not normal. So I put on my bathing suit, but it's not my bathing suit, it's Tammy's bathing suit. <laughs> I, I packed her bottoms. I'm in a men's locker room with women's bikini bottoms on. Eric from my community group can't help it. He's pointing, he's laughing, he's belly aching. This is the funniest thing he's ever seen in his life. And I'm like, you're not supposed to judge me. He's like, I can't help it, you're wearing it. Listen to me. On Judgment Day, some of you are gonna unpack some uncomfortable things, <laughs> right? You guys ever see that on TSA? People that get pulled aside, excuse me, we need to look at your luggage. Look, you may have packed it in private, but it will be unpacked in public. <laughs> My favorite part of that whole process is the slipping on of the gloves. You know why that is? Because they know you're nasty. They're gonna unpack some <laughs> funky stuff, right? Going in, gas mask, Woo! What is this? I don't know who packed that. I don't know, it's strange. Very strange, right? What do they ask you? Did you pack your home bags? Did someone help you pack your bag? Did you leave your bag anywhere where someone could have slipped this odd object into it? Right? What if on the day of judgment, there's just TSA agents? Did you pack your own bags? Did someone help you pack? Is all of this crap yours? Yes, Lord, yes. Jesus will judge whatever I pack. Listen to this, 1 Peter 4, 17. If you're a Christian, would you please listen to this? And if you're not a little rattled, you didn't hear what I said. For the time has come for judgment. Well, I thought, I, I, I thought I'm not judged as a Christian. Okay, we're gonna talk about that more on the debrief this week. You're not condemned. That's what it means by judgment for the Christian. You're not condemned. Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, it's not in your notes, but it is in my brain. You're not condemned. You know what that means? You don't die. Why is that important? The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of Christ is eternal life. When you're saved, you are given eternal life. You are saved forever. But listen to me. The judgment that you and I will face as Christians does not determine whether we have eternal life or eternal death. It determines how we spend eternal life. And some of you are not ready. You're not ready for the time has come for judgment and it must begin where? With God's household. And if judgment begins with us, 
What a terrible fate awaits those who've never obeyed God's good news. Listen to me, Christians. If judgment is scary for those of us who are saved, what on earth does it mean for those of us who have rejected the gospel? That's why the author of Hebrews said it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. same author said this, our God is a consuming fire. It's not the fires of hell that you should fear. It's the fires of heaven. That is power. That is power. Jesus will judge whatever I pack. Second Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all, can you circle that word we? That includes you. That includes your grandma. That includes Mother Teresa. That includes your pastor, Matt Brown. We must all stand before Christ. One of the most famous popes in memory is Pope John Paul II. One of my favorite moments right after his passing is when the Bishop of Rome was interviewed. And they said, where is Paul? Where's the Pope? And here's what the Bishop of Rome said. The Archbishop, I guess of actually of Italy, said this. Pope John Paul is standing before the throne of judgment and is giving an account for his life. We would all do, we would all do well to pray for him as he stands. <sighs> and so many of us don't even think twice about what we're gonna stay Say, but when we stand before a holy, mighty, and all-powerful God. And he says this, I sent my son to die for you on the cross. What did you do for him? What did you do? Remember the parable of the talents? There are three servants, and the last one is a wicked and lazy servant. And Jesus says, take what he has and give it to what? The one with 10 and five, or five and two, depending upon which text you're reading. We will all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. How you spend eternal life will, will be determined by how you spent your earthly life. Listen to me very carefully. Both heaven and hell are personal personal. Romans 14, 12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Are you ready? Are you ready? Now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. The words you wanna hear are well done, good and faithful servant. Listen to me, you've been faithful with a little, now be faithful in much. That's what you wanna hear. Those are the words that wanna be, you wanna be spoken. Remember, heaven is a kingdom. It's a kingdom. It's not that everyone is equal, it's that everyone is saved, but how you spend eternity as a saved individual is about what you risk for Christ on earth earth. Do you know how the Bible ends? Some of you have never read the book of Revelation, and I know it's scary, but the, Revelation says, blessed is the one who reads these words and obeys them. Revelation, the last chapter of the Bible says this, the church and the spirit say, come Jesus, come. And here's what Jesus says to the spirit and to the church that say, come. He says, I am coming and my reward is with me. He brings his reward. We shouldn't be afraid of judgment. We should look forward to it. And here's the beauty. A lot of Christians don't understand. Well, if I'm saved from my sins, why do I continue to confess my sins? Because confessed sins are not held into account on the day of judgment. They're gone. They're gone. They don't exist. You want to shriek your Santa Claus bag? Start confessing your sins. You want a small bag, right? That's what you want. So pack lightly. Pack lightly. Don't carry it with you. So what happens? Some of you, write this down. I need to repack. I need to reevaluate my life. You can't take it with you. 
I love that when people put their bags up on the scale. That's strange. It weighs 76 pounds. It was 50 pounds at home. <laughs> Do you know what happens when your bag weighs 76 pounds and you have a 50 pound limit? You have to repack and you watch people right in front of you making decisions. That's got to go. That's got to go. That's got to go. That's got to go. Why don't you live that way? Why don't you live freely and lightly? Why don't you let go of stuff? I need to repack. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, I, once I wasn't a Christian, but then I became a Christian. He says, I once thought these things were valuable. It's hilarious to me watching people at the airport throw their valuable possessions in the trash. They're tossing it. It can't go. It's not going to make it. I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded anything else, counting it all as garbage so I could gain Christ. Listen, you want to get on an airplane? You got to get rid of that pocket knife that your grandma gave you. I know that it's valuable, but it isn't getting on the plane. It isn't getting on the plane. In some countries, they have glass boxes where they collect weapons that people have to drop off, which is comforting that they found them. But it's a little odd. It's a little odd what people tried to get on an airplane. You know, you know that person at, at the airport that says, thank you for flying. Please be prepared. There's no liquids over 1.5 ounces. And, da, 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 da. and here's if I, I just would love to have that job just for five minutes. Because I would say this, I know that you're all idiots. And none of you are listening to a word that I'm going to say. And because you're an idiot and believe that you're the center of the world, you're going to delay all of us getting on this aircraft. <laughs> so do us a favor and pay attention. When I say take off your shoes, that includes you. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? The person that gets up there with their shoes on, they're like, oh, yeah, your shoes. Like, take it off. I need to repack. I took my dad to airport security. My dad had a Kindle in his bag. My dad had enough water to feed a camel and enough hair gel to comb every man's hair in this room. I'm like, what are you doing? Get rid of all that stuff. You know, I didn't know it was in there. Well, who packed it? So how to repack? Hebrews 12, 1, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. What's the first thing you need to unpack? Your sin. Get rid of sin. Here's the problem. Some of you don't know what sin is. And here's the bigger problem. You think you determine what sin is. Well, I don't feel like that's wrong. Here's one of the worst moments in the history of people. It's in Judges. It says that every man did what was right according to his own eyes. Listen to me. You don't get to determine what's right and what's wrong. It's not your eyes that matter. It's God's eyes. And you will stand before his eye. When we go to these old churches, churches that have been around 1,500, 2,000 years, every time they paint a picture of God, do you know what he is? A giant eye. He sees, and nothing is hidden from his sight. Do you know that he sees deeds even done in the dark? You cannot hide from him. Next, let's go, let go of what's not helpful. Listen, it might not be sinful, but it's not helpful. I ask you to circle that word baggage. The word is skubalin in the Greek, and no Bible translator has the courage to translate it the way it should be translated. The King James, the old King James gets close. It says this, I consider all things dung. And some of you don't know what dung is. Dung is horse poo. But that's not what the word means, because Paul doesn't mean horse poo. Some translators translate it excrement. And if you don't know what that is, Google it. Some one person got it. Here's what the Apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, I consider all things in comparison to Christ human poop. That's what it is. And it's not even poop. Literally, he's being profane to get you to understand what things are in comparison to Jesus. And some of you will have spent your whole life collecting poo. <laughs> On Judgment Day, we're going to be, what's that smell? It's your bag. It's your bag. <laughs> right? Everybody that's had, been a parent has had a potty train. And you know, you ask your kids, did you poop your pants? They all lie. No. No. Well, somebody did. 
And then you look and there's a little special load in there. Well, how'd that get in there? I don't know. Somebody snuck into my diaper and pooped. It's crazy. Look, the Apostle Paul is being profane for a reason because things are profane in comparison to the glory of God. He says, I consider all things scubalin. So I'm gonna help you out. I wanna have a sandals t-shirt that says scubalin happens. <laughs> It'll be our joke. <laughs> so now some of you get it. That's what he means. Next. I gotta hurry because you guys are listening slow. Number three. <laughs> I gotta invite others to look at my luggage. Right? I can pack myself. That's my son's big kick. I can do it myself, Dad. I don't need any help. My son went surfing yesterday. I let him pack himself. He came back yesterday fried like a lobster. I said, son, how'd you do packing? He said, I did great. I said, your face doesn't think so. Your face is angry. Right? Some of us are like teenagers. I can do it myself. Really? You need to let someone else look at your luggage. You need to let someone else inspect your luggage because you don't know how to pack and you're wasting your life. Last point, I need to be ready to leave. Anybody ever missed a flight? Just me? <laughs> it always amazes me when I go to LAX, people are always surprised. Oh my gosh, here's the reason I'm late, there was traffic. Yeah, because that never happens in Southern California. <laughs> I mean, people actually expect the plane to wait because they ran into traffic. Tammy and I were in San Francisco last week, waiting in the airport, and here's what happened. All of the air traffic was delayed because in San Francisco in the summer, they get this thing called fog. And so you have 12 hours worth of airplanes trying to come in, and they got a six hour window to get everybody in and out. And so as Tammy and I were waiting in the terminal, which I could think of a thousand better names of a place to wait than terminal, <laughs> maybe let's call them hopeful, or you'll make it, or something. <laughs> But as Tammy and I are waiting, here's what the person kept come on and saying. He said, your flight is gonna be here any moment. He said, please don't leave or go far. If you need to go to the restroom, go quickly. If you need to go food, do it quickly. He said, the plane will be here and we have 10 minutes to unload it and load it. He said, don't miss your flight because we will leave you. He said it over and over and over again. And do you know that there were people that missed it? Because they don't listen. They don't listen. There's gonna be some of you when Jesus Christ returns, you missed it because you didn't listen. This is what Jesus says. We're gonna close with this. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not angels or even the son of himself, not your uncle Fred, not your former church. I don't care if they have a graph, wrote a book. They don't know when he's coming. Only the father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings. Right up to the time Noah entered the boat, people did not realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them, what? Away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in a field. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two women will be grinding out flour at the mill. One will be taken and the other will be left. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know what day the Lord is coming. This is Jesus. Understand this. If the homeowner knew exactly what time the burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready when? All the time. For the Son of Man will come when you least expect it. The world's not ready, but you should be. Have your bags packed and be ready to go because the Lord is coming. He's coming for us. He's coming to save us and he's coming to judge the world. We must be ready as a church. So let's deal with our baggage in this series so we don't have to deal with it then. Wouldn't that be great if Sandals is in the short line? little TSE pre-approved line. All the other churches are, who's that? That's sandals. They dealt with their crap on earth. So they don't have to deal with it now. They're gonna be like, I should have gone there. Yeah, you should have. You should have. 
Amen. Let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, and that Lord, I, I mean this in the most respectful, reverent way. God, help us to deal with our crap. We are covered in scubalin. We are working for scubalin. Lord, we smell like scubalin. And we pray that right now we would just repent of our sins, refocus our lives, repack our bags. Jesus, help us to be ready. Help us to be right. Help us to agree with Revelation 22 and the Holy Spirit. Let us with one voice say, Jesus, come and fix this broken place. Deal with evil, deal with death. And we pray, Lord, on the day of judgment, our line would be short. We pray this in Christ's holy name, amen.